appreciate it. I want to speak today. Uh, my title is When I'm 64. That's the Beatles song that we're taking today, Community Across Generations. The lyrics of this song go, go like this. Will you still need me? Will you still feed me when I'm 64? Now, I will be 64 in August. So this question has a certain urgency for me. And lately, I've been asking Margie this very question. Margie, will you still need me? Will you still feed me when I'm 64? And I'm sure she's answering yes. You know, I like to think I'm like a, I'm like a fine wine. I get better with age. But never mind. I read that in a magazine. So I want to use this title, When I'm 64, to address the idea of community across generations, intergenerational community. I want to take as our, as our main text, Proverbs chapter 22, 29, instead of the New Living, it says, the glory of the young is their strength, and the gray hair of experience is the splendor of the old. The glory of the young is their strength. The gray hair of, the, of experience is the splendor of the old. I mean, I'm going to be addressing younger people and older people, and I know that's a relative term, and, and uh, I don't want you to get offended by anything I say here. But what I do want to get across to us is that these two realities of being younger and stronger and older and wiser, these don't compete with each other. They're not supposed to be in conflict. I really think they complement each other and fulfill each other. In the Hebrew language, there is a word and between those two clauses, and we'll read it in the Amplified Bible, the glory of young men is their strength, and the beauty of old men is their gray head, suggesting wisdom and experience. And that, that little word and tells me this, that between the younger and the older, we need each other. Younger people need older people. Older people need younger people. And so... In this message, I'm going to speak to young adults, younger adults, younger, and I'm also going to speak to older adults, and then I'm going to speak to all of us, you know, and if you feel you're in the middle, just choose a side. Better yet, why don't you take both sides? I need to define what I mean by young or younger. Uh, you know, I can remember, probably some of you uh, can too, when 30 looked really old to me, when I was 14, wow, 30 was old. Now that I'm over 60, 30 looks really, really young. So for the purpose of my encouragement, I want to kind of look at younger adults as anywhere between 20 and 35. Now, if you're 36, I don't think you're old. You know, I don't even feel old. And you talk to some people that are, have more years than you, and you'll, you'll, they'll tell you that uh, they may be in a 64-year-old body, but they still feel like they're 30 years old. If only this body would keep up with what I'm thinking on the inside. I'm not trying to be too rigid with this, but I just want to speak about the advantages of having older adults in your life as younger people and the advantage of having younger adults in your life as older people. I don't mean by 20 to 35 that teens can't have significant insights. You know, Jesus was 12 and he was baffling the religious teachers at the temple. Uh, Samuel was a prophet at the age of 10. You know, Jesus said from the mouths of babes and infants he's ordained praise. So I'm not trying to be too rigid with it. But I do want to speak to, to, to younger people and older people, and I'm going to start by speaking to you younger ones, and that is that you need the wisdom of older people. You need it. God has placed older people in your life for that reason. And so the first thing I want to encourage you to do is to respect your elders. That doesn't get a lot of play in our culture today, but it's, it's very much rooted in the truth of Scripture. The fifth commandment out of the ten is that we honor our father and mother, that we respect them. Uh, it's the first one that deals with interpersonal relations. So the, f the first four have to do with us and God. Don't have any other gods before you. Don't uh, make an image. Don't uh, uh, make sure you honor the Sabbath, keep the Sabbath. Make sure that you don't take the Lord's name in vain. I might be getting the order wrong. That's the four that have to do with us and God. Then the rest of the six have to do with us and other people. And the first one has to do with honoring our parents. Paul quoted it uh, with a bit of a comment in Ephesians. He said, honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise. If you honor your father and mother, things will go well for you and you will have a long life on earth. You know what I believe about this? I believe that this is the case, not just because there's some kind of spiritual blessing, but also because there is practical utility. There is practical blessing 
in listening to and having an open ear to the, to the words and the input of people in your life who are older than you. I realize as we talk about honoring parents that some of you have parents that you find it hard to respect and they have done bad things to you, you know. They've lived lives that you really don't want to emulate in any way. And, and I'm sorry if, that's, if that describes you. I really am sorry. But at a bare minimum, I think you can still honor them for giving you life. You know, you wouldn't exist without them. Uh, 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 God used your parents, whatever kind of parents they were, God used them to bring you into this world. And I think that alone calls for some degree of honor. Many of you do, thankfully, have really healthy relationships with your parents. You, and, and, and you can honor them for the good things that they've done for you. You know, I learned from my mom and dad how to love Jesus, how to serve God. And I, I, I learned it by watching them. And it wasn't just what they said, but it was how they lived out their faith day by day how they lived out their faith week after week, how they lived out their faith year in and year out. That left an impression on me. And, and, and they weren't perfect by any means. There are, there are no perfect parents, but to a very large extent. I'm the person I am today because of them, and I honor them for it. And when we talk about respecting elders, it doesn't just mean parents. It goes to non-family members who are older than you. Leviticus 19.32 says this, Stand up in the presence of the aged and show respect for the elderly and revere your God, I am the Lord. Now notice this, stand up in the presence of the aged. I think that's culturally informed. We don't necessarily have to do that. You know, it's a good thing to do. The point in this, as we show respect for the elderly, and it's not just parents that Moses is talking about here. Show respect for the elderly, and in so doing, you will be fearing God. You will be revering your God. Respect for elders is directly linked to living in the fear of God. That's what this pa passage tells us. And to show respect for them is one way to walk in the fear of the Lord. Perhaps it's because God himself is older than anyone else, you know. He is, after all, the ancient of days. But there's something in the heart of God that he wants younger people to show respect and deference to those who are older than them. In the Scripture, both Old Testament and New, lack of respect towards parents and elders is always depicted as a sign of moral decay. You know, we read in chapter, in chapter 1 of Romans, and it, in the second half, he, you know, he sort of gives a catalog, Paul does, of all the things that are going wrong with the human race morally. And, uh, and he ends the chapter with this list of various wrongs. Among them are things like uh, wickedness, idolatry, evil, greed, depav depravity. And sandwiched right in that list is disobedience to parents. I was once memorizing scripture out loud on the treadmill in our living room. This is years ago. One of my kids was about seven years old, and, and, I'm, and, and I would, this is what I do. I walk on the treadmill, and then I, I recite scripture, and that's how I'm memorizing the New Testament. And I was, I was reciting this passage, or one like it, and uh, my youngest, Michael, was in the room, and I came out with this idolatry, wickedness, depravity, disobedient to parents. And he said, you just put that in there because I was in the room. So I called him over and had him look at the text. There it was. He was amazed. It was a very meaningful moment. So we need to respect our elders. And, and on, in a practical level, you, young, younger, you younger adults, learn from your elders. And this could be whether you're middle-aged, you could be 45, you could be 50, and still learn from your elders. Stop reinventing the wheel. Older adults have something to show you, and you need it. My, uh, my brother's son, my nephew, is a surgeon in New York City, and I've, I have kind of followed his, his education and his career as we've had family gatherings, and he's told me about, you know, his residency as a surgeon, and now he's in New York doing a, a fellowship, sort of an additional re uh, residency for a specific kind of surgery. And it got me thinking about learning from our elders. You know, surgeons stand 
on the shoulders of those who came before them. What I mean by that is they respect and they learn from the past knowledge of other surgeons and they respect their mentors. They work under mentors. And I'm glad they do. I, I thought of this myself. Which would you choose to do surgery on you? Would you choose the surgeon who's learned from older, experienced surgeons? Or would you, learn, would you uh, uh, want the surgeon who's, who's tried to figure out everything on their own because they think they're so smart? Uh, I think we, know, we all know who we'd choose. We'd choose the surgeon who had listened to the older surgeons and learned his craft, his his skills from them. And what I'm, what I'm getting at for, for, for all of you younger adults, even if you're 50 and you think you're a younger adult, awesome, think of yourself that way. There are people around you who have been through a lot of life, who have been through more life than you have. And there is great advantage. I want you to hear me. There is great advantage for you in having a relationship with that kind of person. Seek them out. This is my encouragement. Get to know them. Include them in your circle of friendship and acquaintance and listen to them. When I say this, I don't mean that, I don't mean that you, you'll do everything exactly like they'll do it. You'll do it in your own way, you know, but with a wiser perspective. You'll do it in your own way, but if you've got some older people around you who can speak some wisdom and experience into your life, you'll do it smart instead of doing it stupid. Look, the fact is none of us can avoid all of all stupid. We're going to do some stupid things, but why not avoid as much stupid as you can? There's a story in the Old Testament about a, a young king named Rehoboam. He was Solomon's son. And and, and when Solomon died and he took over as king, all the people gathered to him to crown him king, and they came with a request. They said, King Rehoboam, your dad, toward the end of his reign, was really hard on us. I mean, he taxed the living daylights out of us. He, he forced us to do labor, to build all of his palaces and all the stuff he had going on. And, and they said, please, can you lighten the load? So Rehoboam said, give me three days. So in that three days, he went to Solomon's old counselors, and he said, what's your answer? What do you think I should say? They said, listen, Rehoboam, if you will slacken up a bit, if you'll give these, these people just a little bit of a break, they will follow you forever. Uh, now, you know, the story tells us that this was the right advice, but that somehow it was not what he wanted to hear. He didn't want to have an open ear to what the older uh, counselors were saying. So he went to his, his drinking buddies, he said, and what do you say? And they say, well, you should just come down really hard on them, you know. Tell them, tell them that my, my little finger's thicker than my father's waist, you know, mic drop. My, uh, my father beat you with whips. I'm going to beat you with scorpions. And, uh, and of course, you know, that was, that was terrible advice. He went ahead and did that, and he lost 80% of his kingdom. You know, it's like the wise philosopher Forrest Gump once said, stupid is as stupid does, my mama always says. So my challenge to you as younger people is who is the older person in your life that you listen to? Who is that person? Could be a parent, could be an aunt or an uncle, could be a, a, a grandparent, or it may not be family relation, any kind of family relation. Who, are, who is it? And if you don't have one, find one. And when you do have one, listen to them, because this is what the promise of the Scripture is, that it may go well with you. You can avoid a lot of stupid by listening, by, by, by learning from your elders. So that's what I want to say to the, to the younger people who are anywhere under 50. <laughs> now I want to speak to, to all the people who we call a little older, maybe anyone over 35, all righty, or 40, and whatever doesn't offend you. Here's what I want to say to all of us. You see my gray hair? I can say us. Older people need younger people in their lives. In our church, we need them. In our individual life, we need them. They're a gift from God to us. So here's my encouragement to, to, to the group that I'm a part of. 
See the value in their, in, in, in their mental energy. You know, young people have got a lot of mental energy. What do I mean by mental energy? I was thinking and praying about this this week as I wrote it. Uh, their degree of innovation and creativity. Their ability to see and value new things. And their ability to see those new things much faster and to see how those new things can advance our vision and our cause. Value their mental energy, which is their, their innovation and curiosity, and value their, flex, their flexibility. You ever see with little kids, I, our, our, our three-year-old grandson lives with us, and I'm just amazed to see how he can squat right down on the ground, all the way down, you know. I would be pulling hamstrings and I'm just, I just don't have that kind of flexibility anymore that, that I used to have when I was younger. But it's not just physically. I think it's also true to some degree mentally. There is a flexibility of thought in younger people that will help us as, older, as the older generation to see things in a new way. Now, look, I, I, again, I don't want to offend. I'm not saying that older people cannot flex. We can we, if we choose to, we can. You can teach an old dog new tricks, depending on the dog. I mean, I began to learn Portuguese when I was 57 years old. E agora, eu posso falar português muito bem. Muito, não muito bem, mas bastante bem. You know, I learn, I, I'm, now I can speak Portuguese very well. No, not very well, but sufficiently well. We can do it, but let's just be honest, it's, it's harder for us the older we get. It's a little less natural. Now look, the upside of gray hair is wisdom and experience, but the downside can be a certain level of rigidity and resistance to change. So value their mental energy, their, their creativity and, and flexibility of thought, and recognize, here's a new, here's a new phrase for you, recognize their new knowledge, their new knowledge. Listen, young people know things that we don't. And I'm not just talking about in the technological area, although that's true. You know, when you need to set up your new computer, you call your 12-year-old grand, grandchild to come in and do it. But more than technology, I believe that young people are capable, on their, uh, uh, capable of their own unique insights that come because of their youth. Uh, and and there's, these are insights that we all need. Businesses need this. Churches need it. Families need it. Because they tend to be more informed about current cultural trends. And those cultural trends matter a great deal as churches and businesses try to keep up with the changing ways of doing things. And this is particularly true when it comes to methodology, how we do things. You know, before you start writing emails, oh my gosh, Rick, you're talking about change. Uh, uh, Faith Family Church will always preach the gospel, Jesus Christ, God's Son, who died and rose again. But how we present that unchanging message will change, it must change change. And younger people are the ones who know better than most the kinds of changes that we ought to make. So here's my, here's my uh, encouragement for all of those uh, who would be count yourselves as older adults. Don't dismiss anyone just because they're young. Don't dismiss anyone just because they're young. Paul said to Timothy, his young protege, don't let anyone look down on you because you are young but set an example for the believers. One translation says, don't let anyone think less of you. Or another one says, don't let anyone treat you as if you are unimportant just because you're young. Now, Timothy was a young man, uh, no older than 30. And, uh, and Paul sent him to do a very, uh, a very tricky and difficult job. Uh, he sent him, he, 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 Timothy had to go to a group of church leaders who were significantly older than him, and he had to respectfully but firmly correct their errors 
in teaching and practice. Can you imagine? And I think if Paul had directed this statement that we just read to these older leaders, I think it might have gone something like this. Don't look down on Timothy as a leader just because he's young. Don't think less of him or treat his directives as unimportant just because he's young. And I think it, what it means to us today as older adults is don't dismiss young people just because they're young. You know, Jesus faced this kind of dismissal himself. He went to a lot of towns, but the place he went to that showed the most doubt, the most skepticism, the highest level of rejection was his own hometown. It was Nazareth. He got up and preached a message and, and they said, who does he think he is? You know, they dismissed him. I think part of it is because they remembered him when he was 13 because they mentioned his family. Isn't this the carpenter? Isn't this Mary's son? Aren't his brothers James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon? Aren't his sisters here with us? They, they took offense at what he was doing and saying. See, they remembered him. They, they, he came, he showed up when he was 30, but they still saw him as if he was 13. And that's an easy trap for us as older adults to fall into. You know, I, I, when, I was a, when I was a kid in England, just before we came to America, I spent six months in England. And all the years before that, my name wasn't Rick. My name was Ricky. My mom called me Ricky. My dad called me Ricky. My mom called me Ricky Tiki Tavi after the mongoose that killed the, the cobra in the, in the uh, uh, Rudyard Kipling story, Ricky. So I'm in England for six months with my relatives, aunts and uncles, and I'm Ricky. All right, we moved to America. Years go by. I drop the name Ricky as I enter the age of coolness. Anybody with, with uh, uh, younger teenagers, you know, you know, they enter the age of coolness. So it wasn't Ricky anymore, it was Rick. That was my new adultish name. So years later, uh, I'm about 20 years old. We visit England again for the first time. I see my aunts and uncles and, uh, and my cousins, and guess what my name is? You got it. It's Ricky, because they still saw me as kind of seven. You think, well, that, you know, that's just because they didn't, hadn't seen you grow up, and they were calling you Ricky. Well, here's why I said this is a, this is a kind of a, an easy trap for older adults to fall into. About five or seven years ago, Margie and I got our kids together and uh, went to see a family counselor. We had a family counseling session. We just wanted to do a check-in uh, and, and see how we were all doing. And I posed this question to them. I said, if there's anything you'd like me to change, if there's one thing that you'd like me to change, what would it be? You know, I wish dad would, would blank, or I wish dad would not blank. And one of them said to me this statement. I'll never forget it. They said, dad, I feel like you see me as permanently 12 years old. Now, they were in their, they were in their late 20s at the time. And uh, it hurt a little bit at first, but uh, faithful are the wounds of a friend, you know. Uh, but it hit me like a bolt of lightning. I'll never forget that meeting. It's, it's burned in my mind because they were right. They were right. I was stuck with them thinking they were at 12 and it was giving them as much trust and confidence as I would give a 12-year-old. But they weren't 12 anymore. They were 27, 28. And so I had to change my attitude towards my, my uh, I'll call them my offspring. If I call them kids, you know, they're not kids anymore. They're all grown up. But, uh, you know, that, that they are adults. And they're powerful adults. So... I'm, I'm encouraging all of you who are in my stage of life or older, whether, you know, whatever you want to define that as, let's not do to the, to the younger people in our church what Nazareth did to Jesus. You know, they dismissed him because of familiarity. Let's stop treating our 30-year-olds as if they're still 13, our 25-year-olds as if they were still 12. Fact of the matter is, I speak to all of us now, older, younger, in between, however you want to define it, we need each other. Young, younger people, you need the wisdom and the experience of older people. Older people, you need the energy and the new knowledge of younger people. Back in the 60s, there was a, 
radical activist named Jerry Rubin. I got a picture of him here. And uh, he was a founding member of the Yippies. The Yippies, Y-I-P, was the Youth International Party, and they called them Yippies. And he had a slogan at that time. In his 20s, Jerry Rubin's slogan was, never trust, never trust anyone over 30, you know. Now, he was for radical and revolutionary change. Well, years went by, and and Jerry Rubin uh, left the activist game and became a very, very successful and wealthy businessman in New York City. And, uh, and so when he was in his 50s, Jerry Rubin had a new slogan. And his new slogan was, never trust anyone under 30. So I'd like to paraphrase Jerry Rubin like this. All of us under 30s need to trust the over 30s, and all of us uh, over 30s need to trust the under 30s, we need each other. And I'll tell you, one of the main reasons we need each other is so that we can successfully navigate the currents of change, the currents of change. There is a, when it comes to the subject of change, there is a permanent tension when it comes to change or to growth. It's a tension between the old and the new. It's a tension between the same and the different. It's a tension between tradition and innovation, between continuity and discontinuity, between stagnation and disorder. I read a book that used this metaphor of a river to describe this tension between these two things. If I can see, show this, here our, our, our young lady is, is sailing her ship of life in a current, and on the one shore, there's chaos, and on the other shore, there's rigidity and we don't want to crash into either shore. So in the middle of this current, there are some of the things we've mentioned that are in tension. You know, there's, uh, to the one side, there's things like innovation and newness and discontinuity and difference. And on the other side of the current, there's things like the sameness and tradition and the old and, and continuity. And if we, if we sail too far over in these directions, if everything's new, if we throw out everything from the past, we are going to crash into chaos. We are going to crash into what I call the rocks of destruction. But if, we, but if we sail too far to this side, if we're just hanging on to some things that we shouldn't hang on to, if we're hanging on to traditions that don't have any intrinsic spiritual value, if we're just hanging on to continuity for continuity's sake, we're going to drift up against the wall of rigidity and worse than that, what's on the other side is we sail through the wall of rigidity. We wind up in the swamp of stagnation. The fact of the matter is we need all of these things. We need innovation and tradition. We need difference and sameness. We need newness and oldness. We need discontinuity. And we need continuity. And that's why I believe we need both older and younger people influencing us, influencing where our church is going even influencing where our individual lives are going. Because if younger people ignore the wisdom and experience of the older, they run the risk of smashing their lives into the rocks of chaos and disorder and destruction. And if older people dismiss the energy and new knowledge of the younger, they run the risk of becoming rigid and drifting into the swamp of stagnation. That's why I'm challenging all of us, younger, younger people, who are the older people in your life who are speaking into your life, influencing your thinking? I'm going to make that same challenge to all of you who would consider yourself older adults. Who are the younger people in your life who are influencing your thinking? You know, we as a church, we desperately need both. Because as a, as a church community that's trying to reach out to a changing culture with a changeless message, our challenge is to find where God wants us in this stream. So we don't want to run under the rocks of chaos and destruction. You know, there, there's some things we cannot change. Like we're not going to change the gospel. We're not going to change the message of Jesus. Uh, some churches do this. They try to accommodate the culture so much that they lose their identity as Christian. You know, denying who Jesus really is radically redefining ethics to better feel, fit, our, fit our culture. So we don't want to do that, nor do we want to become so rigid 
that we stagnate, that we become living history museums of what God used to do, or worse, become irrelevant to the community around us that we're supposed to be reaching. So, Rick, what's the right balance in this diagram? Well, that's the $60,000 question. You know, different people have different views on what is too much and too little. And all of you who are looking at this diagram, you know, this tension between new and old and innovation and tradition and discontinuity and continuity, all of us lean one way or the other, depending on our temperament, depending on where we are in our lives. And, and that's okay, we are who we are, but what I want to encourage all of us and plead with all of us is please don't be dogmatic. Younger people, be open to the need for tradition and continuity, learn their value. And older people, be open to the need for innovation and new things, recognize how crucial they are to the future life of our church congregation. Well, Rick, where does, where does Faith Family Church fall in this, in this thing? Well, I'm going to just say this. When it comes to method, when it comes to method, we lean towards innovation and newness because methods aren't sacred or holy in themselves. Methods are merely tools, and methods change with changing times. Methods change with the culture. Not only do they, but they must if we want to not be totally irrelevant history museums in our community. But when it comes to the message, we lean hard towards tradition and continuity. The gospel doesn't change. Our message stays the same through all of the decades and the centuries and the ages. That's so important. And that message, that changeless message is simply this. God created this world and the people in it. And he said when he'd made it all and made the people in it, he said, it is good. And the first humans who were good when God made them made a decision, a bad one, to go their own way, to disobey God, to do their own thing. And they broke relationship with God, but not just relationship with God, but they they injected a huge level of disorder and chaos into the good world that God had made. So that kind of disorder, and you see the very next thing that happens after Adam and Eve disobey God is that they have two sons and one of them kills the other. And then then the story goes on of of hatred and murder and all kinds of terrible things. The Bible calls that sin. And, And from that point on, we were lost, enslaved to an evil power that controlled our lives, that separated us from love's, God's loving presence. But, but here's the goodness of God, the faithfulness of God, that God didn't give up on His good creation or on the people He made and still loved. God never gave up on His creation and He's never given up on you. He came Himself in the person of His Son, Jesus Christ. And Jesus lived a life of perfect obedience to God. It was the life Adam and Eve should have lived but didn't. It's the life we were created to live, but we didn't. Yet Jesus, who'd lived that perfect life, was executed on a cross like a common criminal, but not for any wrongs that he had done. He died in our place. He died for us. He gave himself up in this way to set us free from the judgment that will one day inevitably come on all sin and wrongdoing. And now he offers us forgiveness and new life that starts now, stretches into eternity. That, in a nutshell, is the gospel. And I can assure you, uh, members of Faith Family Church who are watching, we will never change that message. It'll always be what we proclaim, even though we'll use different methods to proclaim it. But hey, if you've you've never received Jesus as your savior and, and the leader of your life, Why don't you do that today? I'm going to pray a simple prayer, uh, and and you can join me in it. Just bow your heads for just a moment. And wherever you are in your living room or in your car, wherever you're watching this, as I say this prayer, just say it in your own thinking. Say it in your own mind and mean it, and God's going to hear you. If you're a wayward Christian, if you've served Christ once but have gone way off the trail, why don't you say this prayer from your heart? Come back home to God. He loves you so much. Say it with me, oh God, thank you for Jesus. Thank you for loving me so much that you sent your son to die for my sins. Now, God, I acknowledge that I've sinned. 
I need your forgiveness. And I ask Jesus to come into my heart, into my life, to take away my sin, forgive me, make me new on the inside. Jesus, I will follow you for the rest of my life. Amen. Now listen, if you prayed that prayer, God has done something in your life. I'm so glad you joined us today. Thank you for joining us by, uh, by internet and hope you come join us next week. Let me just speak a blessing over you. We sang this song today about the favor of the Lord. And so let me speak it over you. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face to you and give you peace. Amen. God bless you guys.